somebody say that he's faithful, yeah. Faithful, faithful, faithful. Father, you, Father, you are faithful. We have put our trust, we have put our trust in you. Said our God who reigns, our God who reigns. We praise your name. Praise to the only living God. Praise to the holy faithful one. Hallelujah. We praise your name. There is freedom to dance in your presence. Freedom to walk. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the Lord's house this morning and good to have each and every one that are gathered here today. Thank you for being in God's house today. To our guests, we welcome you. So proud and honored to have each and every one. I want to go into the Lord in prayer. I want to remember a little girl, three-year-old, Maylie Ward, got brain cancer. This little girl needs prayer. We want to lift her up unto the Lord. I want to keep remembering Sister Marlene. Uh, she's back out of the hospital, traveling some. She's here this morning, but she needs our prayer still. Uh, Brother Wesley Russian had surgery and doing good. A lot of the pain is gone. We thank God for that, but keep remembering him. 
for us. Speedy recovery. I'm sure there are multiple needs by the uplift of a hand of the Lord right now. Let's pray together for God's will. Lord, we love you. Thank you and praise you today for your grace, mercy, and love. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done, everything that you've given us. And we thank you for this service today that we're allowed to come and gather together to worship you, dance in your presence, lift up our voices, Lord, and sing and hear the good word of God. And Lord, I know that you're a healing God. You're a great heavenly Father. We're asking for healing. We're asking, Lord, for strength and help. That your hand would reach down upon every unspoken need, every outspoken need. This baby girl, Lord, move with your power and presence. Touch every heart and soul. If there be one under the sound of my voice that is lost today, whether online or sitting in these pews today, God, would you help them to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for it. Bless, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Could you give the Lord a good hand clap as the praise team?
your body, won't you come? If you're hurting, won't you come? If you need a friend, won't you come? Yeah. One more time, I will believe. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Run now, run now. Let all agree. Hey. There's no power like the power. Our faith is rising in the building this morning. We're believing that you can do exceeding and abundantly all that we could ask or think. Right now, your lives are being changed. Hallelujah. Bodies are being healed. And as a sign of our faith, we just want to praise you. We just want to thank you for the victory, for the healing, for the things that are to come. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. How great is our God. Tell him how great he is. Sing with me. How great is our God. Oh, we'll see. And oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Help us say the splendor of the King. The splendor of the King.
this morning. God, I've come to worship you. God, I've come to praise you. Thank you for everything. When I look back over my life, how great all I can say is how great you are. across this house and magnify this great God that we serve. Lord, we love you and we magnify your name, Jesus. You're worthy of worship, worthy of praise today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. It's already been said so good to see each and every one of you. Many sick and many afflicted throughout this congregation. Some have got prayed for, several recovering from surgery, and many just feeling blah. So let's just lift our hands. Let's pray just a blanket covering over this entire congregation that God would touch every sickness, every uh, situation today. Can we do that? Lord, we love you. We ask, oh God, for you to move and you to minister, God, upon every need, upon every body, upon every situation. Bless those that are recovering from surgery. Bless those, God, that are, are in the healing process. Let healing come to their bodies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to be dismissed for our classes at this time. Today, Amplify students will be meeting in the Student Center. It is Children's Church today. And, of course, nursery class in the back. And it's still family month. Family month. Some people are ready to get over family month. They ain't got a very good family. But family is more than just your immediate family and those that live within your house. It extends on to your church family. It extends on to... Uh, those that are not blood related to you and their friends. But I'm thankful for our church family. I don't know where I'd be without our church family. Many people may come to this church because of the music, because of the singing, because of the preaching that they like and enjoy. But what makes somebody stay and become part of DPC is because of the family of God, because of the saints, because of those sitting on the pew that they build relationships with. And we call each other brothers and sisters. You don't get that anywhere else. You don't call your co-workers brothers and sisters. 
you don't call those teachers and, and kids, you don't call them brothers. It's, it's connected to the church, and I'm thankful that we are family. There are things in the Bible that may actually may be referring to one thing and, and talking about one thing, but the principle of the thing can span throughout Scripture. And one of those being when God looked at Adam and he said, it is not good for man to dwell alone. And I understand what he was talking about. Adam, you need a wife. You need somebody to make you a sandwich. You need, you need help. He was looking at that. But the principle of the matter is still the same throughout time. It is not good for man to dwell alone. That's why we push family month. That's why we push, push church family. Because it's not good for you to be a lone straggler trying to live for God. It's hard enough to live for God with a church family pushing you and promoting you and helping you and sustaining you and giving you strength than to do it by yourself. And we were not created to live for God, to serve for God, or to work in the kingdom by ourselves. We need a body of believers. Look to your neighbor and say, I need you. And I would give you fair warning that if you try to start separating from the body, if you start trying to separate from the church and begin to distance yourself from those people of God, it's going to be hard to survive in your life living for God. So be careful when you separate yourself. It's hard for introverts like myself to get involved with people. We're not built, we're not wired that way. I saw a shirt one time that says, I don't hate people, I just feel better when they're not around. Can anybody relate to that? And, and let's just, just admit it today. We, 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 you may not be an introvert, but it's just sometimes easier to deal with my own emotions than to have to deal with everybody else's emotions. It's hard enough dealing with my own self. Because people are going to be people. Uh, that's who they are. They all come with issues. They all come with baggage. And guess what? Even those sitting on your pew comes with issues and baggage. Matter of fact, why don't you look to your neighbor and say, I love you, but I don't like you all the time. <laughs> Let's just be honest and transparent here today. And I want to be practical in my teaching today. Uh, I know many times it's my mentality to try to be very spiritual. I love being spiritual, but today I want to be more practical I'm going to use a lesson, if, if you love listening to Brother Raymond Woodward, you may have heard him teach this, this lesson, and I have got it, and I've changed the title and added a few things for copyright issues, um, but I did use a lot of what he taught. Solomon, I want, to, I want to teach today, differences without division, differences without division. Solomon, he, he often taught many wise truths in, in Proverbs, and and many of those are very practical in nature. They are uh, something that's not very spiritual, but you can read throughout Proverbs and you can apply the things in the, that he tells. It's never a story. It's just phrases throughout there, one right after the other, uh, of great practical things that if you apply it to your life, you'll be a well-rounded individual. And so we're going to be practical today. Paul tells and explains oftentimes when he's speaking to the different churches in his epistles, he explains the theology and the oneness of God and salvation. And then he'll stop and he'll say, well, therefore, this is what we do, why we do what we do. And he'll begin to get practical toward the end of speaking to these churches. Because there's really no sense in believing in one thing if it doesn't change who you are, if it isn't becoming practical. You can get up and get spiritual all you want to, but if you walk out those doors and you're not practical about it, then what good is it for doing, standing in front and crying for an hour? We've got to be practical in our living for God. And so we've got to continue that balance of being the church and being a child of God, of being that practical and spiritual both. So the book of Romans does that, and, and Paul starts off with righteousness and faith, and then he transfers to salvation, begins to talk about how this great salvation, and how it's available for all, and how we get to live and experience grace. And in Romans 12 and verse 5, he says this, where I want to take the majority of what I'm going to speak about today in this little simple verse, it says, so we, being many, are one body 
in Christ and never one members one of another. Because we, being many, we, we're made up of many different things, we're still one. We're still one. And Paul was saying because we do have such a great salvation, because we do get to experience great grace, then we must be together in this thing. We've got to be as one. There must be unity. Paul, in his letter to the church, isn't speaking to the new converts, those that just received this great gift of salvation. He is talking to the church that's been in this thing and that has lived this way. He's talking to them and he's saying, you need to adjust your way of thinking. He didn't tell the new converts coming up saying, hey, you need to adjust to adapt to the church. No church, you need to adapt to include these new converts. When a new baby is born into a family, and I can attest to this, the baby isn't the one that makes all the adjustments. It's everybody around that makes those adjustments. A little Sunday woke up twice in the middle of the night last night. He didn't adjust to our sleep schedule. We adjusted our sleep schedule to his sleep schedule. He eats when he wants. He sleeps when he wants. He does what he wants, and we just have to adapt to that. And so it's kind of like new converts. They come in and, and, and they make messes that we have to clean up. But that's okay because we have to adapt to grow the church and grow the family of God. And so Paul is, is doing that. He's addressing the, the new church, the church, not the new converts, but the church. And so I do want to speak to the church, not the new converts this morning, but to the church. Because we should always work toward unity. Unity. Unity to those that are fresh and new in this walk of, of, with God and, and don't believe and understand Scripture like we do, but also unity among each other. Unity for those that have lived and we have worshipped beside and served beside for years. Because unity is our responsibility. Unity isn't something that just happens. It isn't something that just takes place. It's something that we have to work at. It's something that we have to... Uh, push and, and, and work together. Ecclesiastes tells the, uh, the simple s story of, uh, it says, If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You've heard and, and seen the illustration of the rope and, and how if you take one, and I'm not going to show my strength because I don't have much rope today. I'm afraid I couldn't break it, and so... I don't want to be embarrassed. But I could take one of these and I could probably wrap around the strain really hard and probably break this one string. But if you take two or three strings, you can't do it. Some of you might could, but if you got four or five, because together they're stronger together. We all heard that all of our lives. We've seen that taught. We've taught it. Just begin to think about that in my study yesterday and and God said, you can still be side by side with each other and still not be together. Because we're all different. We're all in different walks in our relationship with God. There are some that are stronger and there are some that's not as strong. And so even though we're together, the devil could still grab hold and get the one. Because even though they're side by side, they're still not together. So you can be side by side with the one sitting on your pew. You can believe the same salvation. You can still believe Acts 2.38. But until you get woven together, then you're really not in true harmony and true unity in the kingdom of God. Just because you're together doesn't mean you have unity and woven together. The only way to make this really strong where you couldn't grab hold of one and pull it by itself is if you wove it together and you braided it together. And I'm not a... I can't braid it. You go right over left, left over right. I, I don't know. I can't do it. I've tried with the girl's hair before, but I'm afraid to make a fool of myself this morning. But I could weave this together and make it a cord that you can't tell one from another. You can't pick out one cord from the other. They are together and woven together, and that makes them strong. And that's what we have to do. We can't just be side by side in our beliefs and parallel paths down the road toward the kingdom of God. We have to weave and, and bind ourselves together. We can have differences. Yes, we don't have to have division. Unity is intentional because it isn't always fun and easy to intertwine with each other. Especially those that you don't have a whole lot in common with. 
we have an average of 130 people on, on most Sundays. Some Sundays a little more, some Sundays a little less. And do you know with all 130 people, there's not a, two people that are made up exactly alike. And there are some that act a whole lot like each other. There are some that resemble each other a whole lot, but there's not two people that are identical in their likes and in their hobbies and all their personality traits. Because with 130 people, you're going to have 130 different desires, hobbies, personality traits, likes and dislikes, and all that comes together to form the family of God. But yet the Bible tells us and Paul tells us to be as one. Even though we're many, we're still to be as one. We've got to follow that same principle as the husband and wife are to be twain, one flesh. We as the church have to be together in unity. And what I am going to share with you today is, is something that, is, uh, that has really helped me throughout the years. And these, Has anybody ever heard of personality tests or personality traits? 300 years before Jesus, there was a guy named Hippocrates, and I hope I'm saying that right. He came up with what we know as the Hippocratic Oath that the uh, nurses and many people adapt to, and that's the code of ethics. But he was well before his time. He studied people. He was a philosopher. And so um, he came up what we know as the personality theory. And there are several forms of this today, and there are several different things and ways that people do this. There's the Myers-Briggs test. There's the colors test. There's the animal test. And there's many variations. And some of you probably have taken some of these tests, especially if you're in an office setting and, and the leadership of the office where you're at will push this because uh, it, it's, it's big in leadership theory, uh, this personality theory. But they all kind of are formed from the test or the things that this guy came up. He believed that there were four quadrants of personalities. He also believed that your personality was derived from the fluids that ran through your body. Too much phlegm created one kind of personality. Too much black bile created another. And he was wrong maybe on the science behind why the personalities were created. But he was quite on point with the different personalities. And I love these personality tests. I see one and it's free. I'm going to click on it and I'm going to answer all the questions to see what kind of personality that I have. And it shocks me when I get to the end of that thing and it begins to read what my likes and dislikes are and how I'm made up. Man, this thing just read my mail. Because I love seeing what it says about me. I'm all the time saying, Melissa, come here, answer these questions. She don't care much about it as, as I do. So... I am going to, to pull a personality test on you guys today. Are you okay with that? All right. You need a piece of paper and a pen. If you don't have one, Brother Johnson's going to come and get some paper here and some pens, and he'll pass one out for you if you need one. Raise your hand if you need a piece of paper and a pen. Brother Johnson will bring you one. Most of you ladies. You can even use your phone or iPad to draw on. You don't even have to do it at all. I don't care. The rest of us will do it. We're going to find out about your personality today. What kind of personality that you have. You're going to find out why you have so much problems with your wife. Because you're different personalities. You're going to have, find out why you person sitting beside you frustrates you. It's because of their personality. Their personality. You're going to need to draw on this piece of paper, and, and those of you that don't have one yet, you can catch up. But it's not that hard. You're going to need to draw two lines, making a large, basically a large plus sign. You one horizontal, one vertical sign. You're going to create a, a four pane, basically a four pane window. Go ahead and put that first one up there, so they'll know, Sister Sarah. It's a big plus sign. You can't. There you go. Just like that. If you don't know what a plus sign looks like, this is what it looks like. That's what you need to draw on your piece of paper. This is a very basic personality test. If you get intrigued by this, go home, search out personality test on the Internet. You can uh, get to some pretty detail-oriented one. This is a very basic here today. This vertical line, the one going up and down, 
at the top of this, you're going to write task. Task. And on the bottom of that line, you're going to write people. You can put the next side up there just like that right there. Right, task above the top and people across the bottom. All right, has everybody got a paper and pen? There's one, Brother Larry Black will need one over here. Our activity class today. Write task and then write people. Now, often this is the difference between being an introvert and extrovert because, uh, and we're, we're going to put a dot on this line of where you belong. If you're more task-oriented, you put it above the task. You can put the next slide up there. If you're more people-oriented, you put the dot down toward the people. And This is mine. I'm more task-oriented than I am a people person. If you'd rather be doing something than to interact with people, you put something toward the top. If, you, if you're a people person, you want to be around people all the time, you put the dot toward the bottom. You love being around people, or you'd rather be doing something without anybody being around you, pretty much. Now, me and Dad, we are very different. I guarantee you he's got the dot all the way at the bottom because he's a people person. I'm a task-oriented person. If a visiting preacher comes up to us and hands us the scriptures to give to the media and we are to grab these scriptures and walk back there and hand it to the media, if they hand it to me, and I, I'm not going to notice anybody as I'm walking down the aisle, if somebody says something to me, I'm, I'm not going to hear you because I'm task-oriented. That's my goal. Somebody gave me something to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to carry it to Sister Sarah and nobody's going to distract me and nobody's going to stop me because I'm a task-oriented person. I'm going to make sure I give it to her before I talk to anybody, before I get distracted. If you give them the same scriptures to Dad, and he makes his way back there, 15 minutes later, he may even forget he's headed back there to give scriptures. <laughs> because he's a people person. He's a people person, so that's the difference. He'll sit down at a restaurant, and, and he'll talk to everybody in the tables around, and you can't even carry on a conversation with him because he wants to find out who their mom and who their daddy is, what they, he's, he's a people person. I'm not. I'm not going to, I'll look at him, I'll nod my head and smile, and that's going to be it. My task is here at this table. I've got to eat. Then on the next line, going on the left and right, you're going to put slow on one side, and you're going to put fast on the other. Slow does not mean you're slow mentally, okay? It means you're more relaxed. You're not in a big hurry. You, you approach things by, without getting all worked up. You don't get in a great big hurry. You're just methodical in your uh, approach of things. Now, if you're on the fast side of things, you're just go, 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 go. They, uh, you meet somebody and you're talking, having a conversation with somebody that's on the fast side. They're talking with you, but they're looking over your shoulder trying to See where their next conversation is going to come from. They're, they're just go, 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 go a hundred times. They work on problems at 60 miles an hour. They go fast. Now, ladies, you aren't allowed to pick your husband's dot for him, okay? But you're going to put a dot on that same line. You can go to the next one, Sister Sarah. I'm not a fast person. I'm more of a slow, methodical person. So I put my dot toward on the slow side. Now, me and my... Wife, we are totally opposite on the slow and fast spectrum. She gets to thinking on something in the middle of the day, and it's something she wants to discuss with me. She knows I'm busy, knows I'm working, so she'll send me a text. But she don't just send one text. She sends this question, and then for it beep goes off. There's another question come through, and another question come through, and another question come through. And I'll have four or five, a big paragraph of text messages there where she's wanting all these an answers just, just real quick. And so I just reply with, sure. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny. I, I, we're, we're working on youth camp, as you know, and, and there's a lot of moving parts in youth camp. And, and Brooke, her friend Brooke from, from Shannon, Mississippi, uh, many of you know Brooke Clemens, Jordan Clemens' wife. And, and so she's just like Melissa, and, and she'll call, and 
It's not no, hey, how are you doing? It's, man, they go into whatever it is that's on their mind, man. Just, they're talking nonstop. And, and one of them can't be quiet for a split second before the other one's talking. I can hear them. Man, they're going at it, and they're just talking. They're getting, it's quite comical listening to them because they're fast, 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 fast. That's their minds working, and they're trying to get all of it out before they forget anything. So sometimes she gets frustrated with me because I'm just slow and not, don't really care so much. Just take my time, methodical. But these two dots, what they do is pick a quadrant. There's four quadrants in this thing, and these two dots pick a quadrant for you. And so my two dots was on the task and the slow side, so you can go to the next slide. So that picks this quadrant as my quadrant, okay? So that's what it is. You're, you have the quadrant to the two dots. Wherever they are, picks your quadrant. So go to the next one. So there's four quadrants. There is one, two, three, and four. So I just want to just see today how many of you got the first quadrant, number one. Who, how many fit in number one? Got several, you can look around and pick those. All right. Now, how many got number two quadrant? About the same amount there. What about three? How many of you like me? Got several like me. Number four. All right. It worked out about right. It's generally speaking, in a group of people in the world, wherever you go, it's going to be 25% roughly that fall in every single category that there are one two and three four that's enough differences to split a church that's enough differences to split a marriage that's enough differences to um, cause problems on your team at work and and all that said because we're all different and it even worked out here today probably roughly 25 percent fell in every category but paul said we as the apostolic church even though we're many are to be as one. We went on vacation here um, last week, two weeks ago, I can't even remember now. All the family, myself, Melissa, and, and the kids, and, and uh, it was Hunter and Rachel and their kids, Dylan and Amelia, and, and Brenna and Zach, and Jim, Stephanie. We all rented this big beach house, and, and we was right there on the beach. We said when, from the get-go, we're going to relax. We're going to get up in the morning. We're going to let everybody sleep as long as they want to sleep. Of course, I can't sleep that long. Me and Jim and Melissa and Stephanie, we was all up early, 6, 6.30. We were sitting out on the porch drinking our coffee and listening to the waves. And it was just peaceful. It's not my favorite part of vacation is that early morning when the kids aren't up and screaming and hollering. And I'm sitting there drinking coffee and just feeling the breeze come through. Man, it's taking some of your minds off right now off in left field, ain't it? That's, that's a great time. We said we're not going to get in a hurry. We're, we're eating breakfast at the house. We're eating lunch at the house. But the only time we're leaving is to go eat supper at night. We're just going to relax, do nothing. But Jim, it's not made up that way. He could not sit there. He said, well, I'm fixing to go. He came in there and told us he's fixing to leave ten times before he finally left. But then he left, and he'd drive, just drive around for two hours before he come back. Go, go, leave. We come to relax, but that's the difference in his personality and our personality. And we could have very easily got upset because you don't want to spend time with your family. You don't want to sit here and relax and enjoy uh, this nice vacation, but that's the difference is in us and him. And so he went and done what he had to do for his personality, and we sat back and did what we could for our personality. Now here is the names for the four quadrants. Go to the next slide. Now, yeah, yeah, popular, if you was on number one quadrant, you are the popular people. It's the fast-moving and those that are people-oriented. They are what Hippocrates called the sanguines, the sunny personalities, and we're just going to call them the popular people. The, the next one over, uh, they're still people-oriented, but they're a little slower-paced, and so... Uh, he called them the phlegmatic people because he thought these were the ones that had a lot of extra phlegm on their, in their body. So you got a lot of extra phlegm. We call this the peaceful people. And the third one up is we're methodical, but we're task-oriented. And he called us the melancholic, which is the black. He thought we had black bile in our bodies. We call these the perfect people. The perfect people. How many perfects is out there with me? And then the fourth one is the quick-moving, the task-oriented. He called them the choleric 
people, which is color is the old English word for anger. So we call these the powerful people, to put it nicely. If you fell into this category, you're the powerful people. Now, this personality test works across the world. It works with, with every demographic. It works in the church. It works outside the church. It works in the workforce. It works. And, it's, and like, you, like I said, 25% roughly of every person is going to fall into this. But we've got to keep this in mind that this is not just the saints that fall into these four categories, but it's also the people that we're trying to reach. So the world that we're trying to pull from are going to fall in different categories. So they may not be in your category. It may not be in your personality. So we've got to have a balanced church. Because every personality has a major strength. That's why we love you. But along with that, every personality also has a major weakness. And that's why we tolerate you. And also with every personality that comes with a desire that what makes you happy. So I want you to think about your personality, which quadrant you belong in. And so write down which one it is, popular, peaceful, perfect, or powerful on your paper there so you know as I begin to read some of this off. The first one is the popular people. Go ahead, go to the next slide. Your strength is enthusiasm. If you fail in that, it's you get happy over anything all the time. Just stuff makes you happy. doesn't take much to make you happy, and that's, that's your happy. Your desire is for life just to be fun. You want life to be fun. You want church to be fun. You want everything to be fun, fun, fun. And so it is if the church never does anything fun, you're not fulfilling the need for this personality because they want to have fun even at church. And if you never do anything fun at church, they're not going to stick around. Because they've got to have something fun. That's how they identify. We can't cry every service. It'll run away. It'll run them off. They want to laugh sometimes too. Now their weakness is they're a little bit impulsive. They go every direction all the time with a lot of noise. They build supermarkets for these kind of people. Because when they're going back to the back of the store to get bread and milk. Milk and eggs, they're going to see stuff. Oh, there's a waffle and pit in my buggy. They, they, they're like that. They're impulsive. Can I get a witness in the house? <laughs> but we, being many, must function as one. And then you got the peaceful people, which was the next one over. The bottom left-hand corner. Strength is people skills. They are great negotiators. They can rebuke you or get on to you and make you like it, make you smile while, while they're doing it. They have great people skills. Their desire is they want peace. They don't want drama. They get disturbed when there's tension in the room. They can't handle tension. They can't handle drama. They can't handle stuff all the time. And if these make up 25% of the population, of the people that we're trying to reach, then there doesn't need to be drama going on in the church all the time because it's going to run this group of people away. And it's going to run probably some of them off that's in the church. That's why you can't have drama all the time. The weakness is, is they're reluctant. They're, they hold off making decisions. They can't make decisions because they don't want to upset anybody. If I make this decision, they second-guess themselves because they're going to upset somebody. And, and that's what drives the rest of us crazy is because they can never make up their mind. Can I get a witness in this house? Anybody married to one of these people? <laughs> Just make up your mind. But we, being many, must function as one. The perfect people. Let's go to the next one. The perfect people. Now, I, I acted like it was because we're perfect, but the disclaimer is it doesn't mean that we're perfect. It means we want everyone else to be perfect. We want everything to go perfectly. According to our own definition of perfect, we like perfection. Our strength is accuracy. We like things to be right. We're detail-oriented. We, we get it just right. Even my notes, I've got everything written out nearly word for word. And on Sunday mornings, we are timed. We have to be done at 11.15. So I go at exactly. Today I have 18 pages. So at the bottom of page 9... I know we're going to be here for 50 minutes. I take 25 minutes. I add it to 1025. That comes up to 1050. I put 1050 at page number 9. It says, at page number 9, I know how I'm doing it. i got to be at 
1050, I've got to be at this point or beyond. That blows some of your minds. But I don't even do the halfway mark. I also do two more marks because I want to make sure I'm on time. I'm, that's how my brain works. I've got to have it perfected. So accuracy, we get it right. Our desire is perfection. We want the music to be perfect. We want church to start on time. We want the media not to freeze up. We want perfection. We want there to be no dead time. And you can't reach this group of personalities if you just throw things together at church. If everything's just half-heartedly just thrown together at church, you're not going to reach this group of people. You can't get up there and tune the guitar while church is about ready to start. They don't like that. It's, it's, you're not got it together. And that's our problem. That's our weakness. We're too thorough. Brother Thomas, are you in this category? How, how did I guess? <laughs> if anybody's ever helped Brother Thomas roll up an, a cord up here, you'll know what I'm coming from. I don't think I'm as bad as Brother Thomas, but it's got to be in a perfect circle, no bigger than this right here, curled up. And the rest of the group's waiting on you to load the gun so we can charge and fight this battle. But we're still sitting there pumping and getting everything just right because we want it to be perfect. But we, being many, got to be one. Then there's powerful people. These are the people that you tread lightly around. Powerful people. Their strength is they, they take the initiative. They come up with plans and programs for everything. You give them a little bit, man, they're going to take it and they're going to go with it. Their desire is they've got to have control. If they have no control, nobody will get hurt, nobody will die if you just give them control. And if you're going to have these in the church, you've got to give them something to do. They are not built to sit on the pew and just sit there. They, they have to have something to do. They've got to take control of some things. And their weakness is they're a little bit insensitive. Can I get a witness in the house? <laughs> There's a, there was a denominational uh, pastor that had, a church had lost a pastor. And so the deacons came to that assistant pastor and they asked him the question. said, what do you do? We only come on Sundays. We don't come Sunday nights or Wednesday nights. And we're really not sure what you do. But we want to keep you on staff. But we just want to know what you do. And he said, well be honest with you, I just followed Pastor around, and whatever he did, I did. And where he went, I went. He said, the only thing of it is that when he left the room, I would stay in the room just a little bit longer, and I'd say, he didn't mean that. Because his pastor was a powerful quadrant. He, he, he hurt people's feelings. He was a little bit insensitive. And so this assistant pastor went around and tried to smooth things up for the pastor. He had learned how to work with a powerful personality. And we, being many are one how many of you married to someone that has a different personality than you I can raise my hand I think everybody in here about it that's married says hey I'm married to someone that's in a different because opposites attract or opposites attack I'm not sure <laughs> but even in the church it works the same way you are attracted to people that are different than you, that have different personalities. And that same principle applies. You're attracted to them. And the things that attracted you to that person and to that friend of yours is the very thing that probably drives you insane and crazy about them because of their personality. And if we're not careful, the devil will use that to drive a wedge in between you and them because they're just natural tendencies of that person. That's just who they are. That's just who they become. And so we, the devil will use that to his advantage and try to draw and, and create these gaps and these differences. And so what we do is teach these things to get you to understand that they're just different. That's their makeup. I can't understand how somebody can be people-oriented like daddy. I can't wrap my brain around it. But it's, it's true, it happens, and, and he can't un figure out my personality because it's, it's totally different than the way you are. And so because someone's different than you, it's hard to comprehend and understand where they come from, but that's just their personality. But we can be different and not have division. We can be different without division because we are many and we operate as one. Now you may have noticed today that you have qualities of more than just one trait. 
may have a hard time making up your mind which one that you uh, picked on. And so this is normal because most people have a primary type and a secondary type. You're, you're strong in one quadrant, but you've got some, you know, some characteristics of the one beside of it. Now, you will hardly ever be diagonal across. You, will ne- you might go to the one to right below you, the one right to the left or the right of you or right above you, but you won't go off diagonal because that's just called mental illness. Nobody, nobody can be in those two quadrants. It's called bipolarism, I believe. They say there's some folks in here like that, huh? <laughs> but we as a church, we try to include everybody. We try to retain everybody, and we try to win everyone. And so we try our best to make sure everybody is included. And we let them know that we're behind them even though we may not like their personality. We had a skating event Thursday night. We had a great time. And it, and it just it warmed my heart to know that there were elders there that weren't going to skate. That weren't there to probably eat pizza. They may not have even eaten pizza. But they were there because their church family was there and they wanted to be a part. It wasn't what they enjoyed. It wasn't what they liked it was more for the younger generation it was more for the outgoing people but hey I want to come and be involved because it's my church family and you're not going to like everything that goes on here at this church but you should get involved with this church because it may not fit your personality but it could fit somebody else's and we're trying to be unity and be supportive one with another Paul was saying we may be different. We may come from many different personalities. From time to time we see things differently from eye to eye. But we've got to become as one. Become as one. And just because you have one personality does not mean that the person that has a different one than you is wrong. Let them be the ones that will challenge you and cause you to be better. Cause you to be better. Behold how good and pleasant it is for men to dwell together in unity. We should strive for that unity. I'm going to skip a few scriptures because I am running out of time today. I am running out of time. So Romans 14, 13. Got that one. You can pull that one up. It says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. In other words, let's let's not judge one another because of the differences in personality here. Stop judging everybody else and judge your own self. and, and, And don't let what you want or what you desire and what you have a preference for hurt someone else. Now, the basic of this scripture is, and, and, and the context of this scripture is, is, is based upon idle meat. Now, uh, back in these, the pagan people would offer meat, burnt offerings unto idols, and they would do that. And, and so here this cooked meat was, and they would take this meat, and they would sell it at the marketplace, and it would be discounted price because it was idol meat. It was meat that had already been cooked, already been used for idol worship, and so they sell it. Now, a lot of the pagans would not touch this meat for nothing in the world because it was something they believed in. They was the ones offering the meat. They were the ones that worshipped the idols. But those people that were filled with the Holy Ghost, those people that knew that these idols had no power and had no dominion and had no reason for anything, they said, what's hurt? It's barbecue meat on sale. Let's buy it. Let's eat it. And so the church people, Paul was addressing the people from the church. He said, you know, I know you think it's okay to buy this meat and to eat it and to partake of it. And there's nothing wrong because it's just something that was offered to idols that had no power. It wasn't hurt. But now we've got some Gentiles that have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they were the ones that just offered that meat to the idol the week before. And here they come in and see you eating idol meat. And so it says, don't be a stumbling block to them. If it's as simple as buying fresh meat, you go buy fresh meat so that you don't hurt or upset your brother because of your preference. Romans 14 and verse 15, he carries it on a little bit further. It says, if, if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, or you're not, you don't have a lot of love going on. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Don't you do something, even though it's okay for you to do, if it's going to hurt the one beside you because of your preference. 
That's why he said in verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Until you learn the context of what Paul's saying, it's not about whether you get idle meat or, or fresh meat or what. It's not about that. What it's about, what the kingdom of God really is about, it's about righteousness and peace. Peace with your neighbor and peace with your brother and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, we don't, we don't have this problem today. We don't have idol worship. We don't get to go to the market and buy idol meat or fresh meat and have that decision and, and all that. But the principle, going back to the principle, the word of God is still the same. And so the principle is still the same and it should apply even today that there are things that could be done that really doesn't matter. All it is is a preference to us that we cannot do to hurt our neighbor and to hurt our brother. So we've got to stop letting our own preference and what we like cause division with someone that does not prefer that. So let us just, let's pull that, let's pull verse 15 back up, Sister Sarah. So let's replace meat with preference here. But if thy brother be grieved with thy preference, with what you think is okay, now walkest thou not with love, because don't destroy him with thy preference for whom Christ died. Verse 17, let's, let's pull that up. Because the kingdom of God is not about preference, but it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The principle, you understand here, the principle is still the same. We can't allow our own preference for our personality trait to dictate and, and to rub roughshod over somebody that doesn't have the same personality as we do. So you know my personality trait. And I let you glimpse into my notes just for a little bit how I lay my notes out. But can I be vulnerable and transparent without sounding like I'm throwing shade at anybody this morning? Can I, can I do that? Can, can, would you let me do that? So I like the service to be planned out to a T. I don't like deciding mid-service who's singing the next solo. I like to know who the singers are. Can I get a witness from back there in the back? I like to know the songs that they are singing. I like to know what mic they're using. I don't like it when that special singer that's singing a special song walks up here and they haven't got with Angie before service and they walk over there and there's a dead moment in service. I'm sitting over there, I'm just getting antsy when they're over here discussing the song in service and everybody's up here waiting on watching for them to come sing. That could have been done before service. I want the one that's doing prayer and leading prayer not to wait and let there be a big span of time as soon as that person steps away from the pulpit, they're stepping up and they're leading us in prayer. That that flow keep going. I don't like that dead space. When they start the song and they're halfway through the first verse before the lyrics start working, I don't like that, Sister Sarah. I don't like it. I don't like it, Brother Thomas, when I say praise the Lord in the microphone and it's not working because it's muted back there. That's my personality trait, okay? I don't like it when church starts at 10.01 or 6.01 on Sundays or 7.31. I want it to start on time. If we have testimony service, I want those that have given testimony to know about it ahead of time and to have their thoughts processed in their mind to get a microphone and to say it with authority and, and all that stuff. I like perfection. That's my personality. Remember, I landed that quadrant, but we're human. And I understand that there are these things that I just named that's going to happen no matter how good we are, no matter how hard we try. There are things that's going to happen because we're human. And there's going to be things that happen in the stuff I just described nearly every service. But some of the best and greatest moves of God have been in those services where all of that stuff happened in one service. We started late. The special singer didn't know their song. The mics didn't work. The lyrics didn't work. Didn't know who was singing. We went by the seat of our pants and we had a move of God. And so I understand that my way is not the only way. Although I think it should be. I believe we should strive for perfection. We should. And that won't change. But my preference does not dictate a move of God or not. Nor does yours. It may not be the songs you like. It might not be the leadership style that you like. It might not be the way you like it to be. It may be this whole family month. Man, it's, it's different. It may not be your style. It may not be your preference. But you can't allow that 
to hinder someone else. I can remember being single and watching kids run wild and making those statements that said, boy, if that was my kid, or if I'm not going to let my kid do that. Then I had kids. And I get a witness from some of you that made those same statements, then you had kids. And I ate my words. The truth is you can let your kids sleep in the bed with you or you can make them sleep in their room in the far end of the house and when they're old you'll not tell a difference in which kid was which. You can let your kid have breast milk or formula and when they're 20 years old you can't tell the difference between those kids. It's preference. Sure, you might have read an article about which is better but the truth is when they're grown you can't tell a difference. And so the same way when it comes to applying our walk with God and we got to stop letting our preference divide the church because we can have differences and still not have division. We can still have differences and still come together as one as Paul tells us to do. The difference is what makes the church beautiful. The difference in you and me and all these personalities meshing together and coming together and having different things and different opportunities for ministry and different things begins to happen. And I'm thankful for the difference. You know, the world pushes and promotes, celebrate your difference, celebrate your difference. And I'm not saying we should allow sin or celebrate sin. But I am saying sometimes we stand so firm and so hard against that that we also don't celebrate differences in personalities either. We come to church and we think it's got to be our way or the highway. And I'm, I, if, there, if someone is not exactly like us, it causes division to creep in. And so Paul would say, you may be many, but you've got to be one. Let's pull up his last verses of scripture as the classes are coming back out. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through 25 says, But the body, this is Paul speaking, relating it to again, the body is not one member, but many. The foot shall say, I'm not the hand, not the body. Therefore, does that mean it's not of the body? No. If the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not the body, is it therefore not of the body? Nope, it's still part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But God had set these members, every one in the body, as it had pleased Him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Can't be just one way. Can't be just one personality. It takes all this working together. Now they are many members, but yet one body. The eye cannot say into the hand. This is the meat of the message here. If the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of thee because you're not an eye. You can't, the head can't say the feet, I've got no need for you because you're not like me. You look different than me. You smell worse than me. Can't do that. No, much more of these members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Necessary. These toes keep you balanced. They seem unnecessary, but they keep you balanced. And these members of the body which we think are less honorable, those that don't jihad with our personality, Paul, man, we just bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked. Verse 25, our last verse of Scripture, that there should be no schism in the body, that there should be no division in the body, but that the same members have the same care one for another. You've got to care for the personality that's different than you. You've got to care for the one that kind of gets on your nerves a little bit. You've got to care for everybody. Just because they're not like you does not mean they're not part of you. Amen. Let's all stand all across this house. Unity is something we must work at. Unity must be something that we strive to keep and strive to, to, to push at this church at DPC. And no, everything's not going to go like you like it. But we can do it together. Could we lift our hands and let's pray that God would give us unity in this house. God help us today. Help us to look beyond what we want and our preference. And God let us include everybody. Because we are but one body. We are but one body in this place today. We give you praise that you're the head. We give you thanks God that you're over this body. And we pray God we would be a light that's pleasing to you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you're seated. Anybody that's 13 year old or 
under 13 year old had a birthday these past two weeks it's actually two weeks since we've had church we want to make sure we recognize these kids king's kids all right all of our king's kids come up today king's kids come sing big and loud today Do you love him? 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 going to take up our tithes remember two weeks worth of tithes this morning in case you forgot we won't forget for you
Aren't you thankful for some good teaching this morning? I never was popular in school, but I'm popular now. Yesterday, we kept little man night before last. And got up yesterday real early with him and fed him his bottle. And my wife normally goes on Saturday and eats breakfast with her sister. And uh, she said, well, he's awful sleepy. I said, well, just go on. You take him, go on. Be good. I'll stay here with him. You come back, then I'll go to breakfast. So that's what we're doing. So I went into the cafe yesterday, and they were full. Seen another man that I knew. I just went over and pulled the chair up, sat down beside of him, and went talking. Ate my breakfast. We had a big conversation. I got up, went to another table, and talked to these people for a little bit. Went to another table, which was Steve Newman, talked to him for a little bit. And went over to another table, which was Sister Omega and Andrew and Heaven, talked to them for a little bit. So I started my way back up, backtracks, stopped back by Steve's table talking to him. First table I talked to was Brother Jeff Horner, his wife, talking to them, had my ticket up here just talking away. Heaven got up and started out, and she slipped around behind me. She grabbed my ticket. I tried to get her back, you know. She said, no, I'm old man by man here. He said, to get your ticket and pay for it. I said, well, you know, thank you. Sister Darla said, you know, what? what is it that you're doing, just walk around to somebody that takes your ticket. <laughs> I said, I've tried three tables, and it took three tables for somebody to buy my breakfast this morning. But I love people. I love talking to people. I love being around people. And I'm thankful for the church. I'm glad there are diversities in the church. And it doesn't matter if you're a 60-year-old, Lord, how did I get there? Or you're a 6-year-old. There's always diversity. Every kid's different. Every mom and dad's different. Every grandparent, we're all different. Me and my wife, we're different. We're different. She gets so upset with me because I just hit a lick and a promise. It'll come to pass or it won't. We'll get through it or we won't. It's all in his hands. We can't change the course of what God's got laid out for us. But she wants it. She, she's kind of like Brent. She wants to write everything down. This morning... Oh, uh, yeah. Well, actually, it was might have been last night. We got in. It was getting kind of late, and I was checking the weather out. She said, we want to build another house, you know. She said, this plan ain't working out. Just right. We need to go over this plan. She's over here. She's, I'm checking the weather out. She's laying it off in my lap here, you know. I, said, I don't want to fool with that right now. Laying it off beside her. But this morning, we're going to have to check that plan out, you know. We ain't started no house yet. The lumber's too high. We got to get this plan down. She said, it'll come. We'll get it. We'll get it. It'll be there. Aren't you glad we're all different? Yeah. Yes, yes. And we're thankful today you've been in the Lord's house. We're excited about what God's doing. Our young people went Friday night to Lexington to a little youth service, and Lorelai received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Uh, we are thankful for that. And Elizabeth is mad at her sister because Lorelai got it and she didn't. That's a good thing to be upset over, I guess. Told her it's a free gift. You just keep on. It's coming your way. You'll get that Holy Ghost too. Can I get a witness, somebody? How many likes to paint? Oh, come on. Surely somebody here likes to paint. My daughter does. She's painted her house 20 times in the last five years. Well, our, our city, aren't you thankful, Decaturville? And, uh, we want to be a, a light to our city. Well, Sister Jennifer's kind of checked around and good friends with some of our city employees, and they're going to repaint the garbage cans in the city. And they're going to put, you know, little stuff on them, you know, and, stencil it in and all that. They're going to furnish all that, but we said, well, our church would jump in on that, we thought. <laughs> we paint these cans all black, you know, then somebody stencil in, you know, it could be a two-part deal. Now, how many would like to paint? Oh, we got some hands now. All right, all right. We got some babies that, yeah, we'd love to paint. Just give us some paint. But we're going to try to do this. And I'll give it to Sister Jennifer. She'll set it up for you. Those of you that can paint the 
garbage cans sitting around the city and uh, just put ourselves out there. We have taken the uh, uh, youth camp over. We're going to be doing a youth camp up in Dixon at Lake Benson, and we're excited about that. We're going to be spearheading this, and Brent's getting together with some of the other churches, and they are working together to have a great youth camp in July. Don't forget about that. You need to get your registrations in if you haven't. I've signed a bunch of them, and hopefully we've got them all. But if you have one, got to get that done. Need that today. Also, camp T-shirts. If you want to order a T-shirt, get with Sister Rachel and get them turned in. We've got to have that done ASAP. 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 You know what that stands for? Get her done. Quick. Men's breakfast is going to be the 19th. The 19th. That's on a Saturday. We're having it uh, catered in or made here. But Wayne Pilkerton again is going to help us out with that. Five dollars a head for all you can eat. There'll be skeet shooting and other things going on. So remember that. Also Wednesday night, going to be having a split session. It's going to be a men's and it's going to be a women's. Not going to be little small groups this time. It's going to be a men's group and going to be a women's group. Women are going to have a round table forum, and the man's going to have a round table forum. Going to have some of your preachers, some of your preachers' wives setting up, and they're going to be answering questions. So it's going to be pretty good, pretty good Wednesday night, 730. Don't forget about that. Anything else needs to be announced? Graduation banquet next Sunday. You got that on the board? Bring that announcement up if you would. Just kind of let you get an idea of our graduates. We have Sister Emily, that's a senior graduate. Lord, I don't know all these little. Give it a moment. There they are, the kindergartners. We've got four or five kindergartners. Four kindergartners, so remember that. That's going to be next Sunday night after church. We'll be bringing a meal and eating and just having a good time and celebrating our graduates and encouraging our little ones to go on through and encouraging our senior ones, grab it and go with it. Grab it and go with it. Graduate. Also, uh, 4th of July is on Sunday. We'll be having church that Sunday morning and that Sunday night. We'll be having a fireworks show that night after like we've always been doing. Uh, if you've got plans and you've got vacation time and you're going to be gone, well, you'll miss a great time around here. We're going to have a good time, so remember that. Stand together with me all across the house. Woo, it's hard to believe that graduation is here already on us. I was looking into the next month. Thank you for being here. Remember tonight's service, we're going to have church. Look at your neighbors. We're going to have church. For those of you that rather have church, we're going to have it tonight. Say, praise God. I love church. Six o'clock. Come early and pray. God bless you in Jesus' name.